Hello and welcome to Erupt, the home for how businesses can scale and transform. Throughout this podcast, we aim to inspire and educate to help you and your business thrive. Across the course of our episodes, we'll be interviewing industry leaders to uncover some of the challenges across the world of work. We aim to give an insight into some of the fastest growing organisations across HR and technology. Please follow us on our journey to erupt and elevate your business. This episode is from our Erupt Learning and Talent Conference, which was hosted in September 2022. The conference focused on topics from developing emotional intelligence to creating a transparent future career. This conversation was about providing the Netflix of Learning experience with John Moon, who is Learning Experience and Technology Lead at Sodexo. John spoke about personalising technology to work in a certain way. He discussed how learning management systems should be based on what others require and questioned what is a perfectly personalised learning plan and how are we tagging our learning. I hope you enjoy and make sure you check out the Go Erupt website for further content and for all videos on demand. We'll kick the conversation off with John and we'll be talking about providing the Netflix of learning experience. Um, so John, if you just want to kind of give us an introduction um, uh, into self first and foremost, and then I'll kick off with some questions. So my role at Sodexo is looking after, as, as the title says, actually the learning experience for all of our employees across the UK, Ireland, and several parts of the North Sea region, um, particularly where we work offshore. And a big, big part of that is making sure that whatever systems we are using to support learning and development, so primarily our learning management system, is fit for purpose and is delivering what our users, our learners require. And I think for me, the the term the Netflix of learning or the Netflix of learning experience has been around for a long time. And it's something it's something you hear a lot about and then wonder, well, do people understand what we really mean by this and is everybody using the same terminology and sort of my experience says no they're not a lot of people are you are seeing it literally as it said where once you dig into the topic a little bit more about netflix of learning experience it's all about making sure that people can find what they want in an easy way No, for sure. Okay, brilliant. And first question then to kick us off, yeah. what what does the Netflix of learning mean to you? So I, I kind of segued a little bit into that, into the intro. Yeah. Thing. But to me, it's learning practitioners putting their content into a format that makes it easy for somebody to find. And for me, I, I suppose the best way to bring that to life is for us across our bit of the region in our company, we have some 26,000 plus English language learning modules available to our users. Mm. And that sounds like that. That's fantastic. What a brilliant offer. You've got 26,000 plus um, learning objects. There's something for everything. And there is. But the, the flip side from a learner's point of view, where do I start? How do I find what I need? Mm. How is 26,000 lines of information presented to me? And for me, that's where the Netflix style comes in is, well, can we curate that down into simple lists? And in our terms, um, in our language, we call we call them playlists. So probably borrowing more from the Spotify kind of um, era of the internet than Netflix in many ways. But it's that same, take a big pile of content and chunk it into something that means something to the user. So want something, want something on Excel. So there's a list of Excel content. Um, if this was Netflix, you'd see it as a vertical banner and ours, it's a horizontal. But for me, Netflix of learning and the learning experience is around bringing things together in an easy way for the learners to find associated content. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. And I guess the next question lends quite well to that. Certainly when you talk about associated content and, and playlists, and I like the way you kind of used uh, Spotify there. Um, and the question is, what do employees now actually want from their employee development plans? Do they actually want binge learning? I, I think there's two schools on this. Uh, I'm certainly seeing probably those that organisationally would call like top talent are mm-hmm. really looking for lots of content, lots of different things because they're really trying to push themselves forward. 
probably the bigger demand is coming from the, 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 the standard user that's not looking for learning because they're specifically looking to develop. They may be as well, but right here, right now, there's something they need to know how to do that they don't know how to do. So for me, there's two parts to that learning development plan. There's the how do I grow and how do I help the learners grow their careers, but also how do I give them content now that will help them solve the problem that's sitting in front of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and does creating uh, supposed perfectly personalised learning built by technology actually hinder innovation and limit creativity? What, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, th I think it's it's a challenging question, actually, Marcus, because what is a personally per a perfectly personalised learning um, plan? Um, and how, how accurate is it? Uh, and it it puts me to mind when we talk, if you talk to anybody who's into their coding practice and the computer man programming is there's no such thing as a random number in a mm. computer program. We have random number generators, but they're not. They're actually just picking it off a predefined list. And I would argue personally that the same is true in these automated AI built playlists of content. They're only providing the content that somebody has given it to provide. Mm. So... I'm, I'm a little sceptical, if I'm honest, and I know I've not actually come near to answering your question yet, Marcus. <laughs> Magnus, so apologies. But I'm a little bit sceptical about what actually is that, or what is, the, what is it that it's producing, and it could help with um, creativity and innovation, or it could very much limit it, and I think it's down to what's been put in at the back end. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Does that give you enough of an answer? Sorry. No, it does. It does. It does for sure. Um, and 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 obviously, bear in mind this was initially supposed to be a two-person conversation, so you don't be a bit of a, a bit of back and forth here. So you are under 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 a lot more pressure here, John. But um, but no, that certainly answers the the question. Um, so how can we become more topic specific uh, with our data gathering? So I, th I think the um, reporting and data gathering is always the, bi the big challenge, the, the golden ticket, and it's really what we all want. And I think it comes down to going back to our heading, um, Agnes, if we're looking mm. at this as Netflix style or playlist styles of learning, it's understanding which of those playlists are getting the hits. Mm -hmm. So how are we, in terms of looking at an LMS like the one we use, it's how are we tagging our learning so that we can then report by the tags. Mm. And it, it's almost like the learning, learning management system industry and the learning management system users need to take more information from the general um, internet. Because if, you, if we were running a website of learning content rather than an LMS, we'd be mm. all about hit rates, page bounces, entry pages, exit pages. Well, what we actually need to start doing, if we're going to be topic specific, is doing that similar level of analytics on our learning content. Mm. So where are people launching content? Um, what are they, where are they getting to the platform from? Is, is there one route into the learning management system? Where are they coming from? And is there something we can do earlier in that to give them the information so they go straight to the right place? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it probably falls onto one of my favorite metrics that I spend a lot of time measuring with, certainly with our internally created content, almost as much as the stuff we pay out for, mm. is something we call conversion rate. Okay. Uh, what percentage of the people that start a module actually finish it? And is there a drop-off? Because that, for me, is really, really indicative. And it goes even deeper than topic-specific. It's saying the learners aren't completing this. So we're either answering their need, why they came to it really, really quickly, and they're going, I don't need to do the rest of this, I've got what I wanted, or this isn't what I wanted at all in the first place. Mm -hmm. So then it goes back to that, right, is it in the right category? Are our tags right? Is it on the right playlist? Mm -hmm. Okay. And is there, and, and sorry, veering off our, 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 our questions here, but yeah? is there any way of actually kind of working out um, which of the two categories people sit in um w without actually speaking to them individually which uh, we have thirty five thousand in yeah, the uk and ireland so it's a little bit <laughs> i've got to be honest um, <laughs> i'm a big phone bill um, 
the the reality is we just have to take educated guesses if you yeah, if I'm course. honest and go if it's a 10 minute e-learning module and most people are exiting after the two minutes mm. my suggestion is that the other eight minutes are unnecessary maybe what we should do is speak to our designers and have 10 two minute sessions mm. and break it up into a curriculum of parts and then see is are we still are we getting completions on that part one and nobody's bothering to log into part two because that then tells us we got it right mm. Mm. so it's a little bit of try it test it review yeah. it and does that give us the answer? Okay, fantastic. And we've got a really interesting question in the um, in the in the session chat. I'll read it out. I'm sure you can see it as well. Um, but it says this already works for me with YouTube, my go-to yep. learning platform. In many cases, I find navigation easy, but my challenge is to know when to stop following suggestions. Does the LMS platform help by knowing something of the organisation and my role, then build playlists? Um, yeah, that's a brilliant question. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I think it, it kind of goes back to my point around the perfectly personalized playlists, if I'm honest. So many of us now in our personal lives will use YouTube as their go-to, how do I do this? Um, we call it in the learning industry, we talk about a lot about this thing called learning in the flow of work. I need to do this thing now. How do I find out the information on how to do that thing? And I don't need loads of course on it. I just need mm. an answer to this. Um, and so LMSs have always got this bit of a challenge of how do we measure up to that mass of content that is YouTube. And again, it really comes back down to the advantage of the LMS is it's not always completely automated and shouldn't be. There's a human being looking at the content that's in that suggestions list. Mm -hmm. YouTube, Technically, there are humans involved in the process somewhere of what's suggested, but the volume of content is just so absurd that nobody really knows what's all, all of what's on there. Yeah. And LMS, we do have the advantage of there's people in the background who can see the content and can make sure those suggestions, those playlists have got good quality content that is linked to the challenges of our organisation. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic answer. Ho ho hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Andrew, um, and please feel free to continue to ask questions uh, in the chat. Um, but John, is this period one of the most important step changes for organisations in their ability to engage with their employees, would you say? Uh, I, I'm going to say, yes, it is, but not, not necessarily any more important than other periods. It's just different. So... We hear a lot about of talk about obviously the big shift from everybody being present in offices all the time to remote work, hybrid work, and the blends that are going on in our business. Mm. And yes, inevitably, that means we have to do things differently as organizations to work with and support equally both those groups of people. And for us, facilities management, we have every option you could come under the, under the sun of that category from people who have are doing the, the front end work, working with clients that have to be on sites to people that can be totally remote working from home all the time. So yes, we have to manage and map our learning offer, our learning technologies to support both those groups. Mm. So on that sense, yes, there's been a huge step change. But before that, there were other step changes of equal importance at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, have it. And what technology should we have within our within our suite? Um, and is the technology all that it lives up to be? Oh, I love I love this question. Um, <laughs> as, and I have to preface this, Magnus, and say, as an absolute techno technophile, I love my technology. Before I start this, um, and there's a lot of people who know me would be shocked at what I'm going to say, but it's not necessarily about the technology. Mm. We have to see this as the technology is the means to an end and the end is more important than the tool we use to get there. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, we need technology. Yes, with remote work, hybrid work, as I've said, the demands of that technology have massively changed recently and we need to have LMS platforms, LXP platforms, depending on our offer, combined platforms we have to have ways to host content and get it to people and then technology that will allow us to report on that so that we can make mm. the intelligence 
but overarching all of that we must not lose sight of the fact it's not about having the latest tech platform it's about making sure our, the people in our organization have access to quality learning at a point that they need it and that then we can do something with the data from the back of it mm. um, so often i see people talk about well th this lms doesn't do what i need it to do i need it to do more and more this this and this and i'm all kind of pulling them back to go do we actually need the system to do that or if we took your need in a slightly different way with the system we've got already actually provide the information and the learning mm. and at least 60 percent of the time the answer is yes we could adapt the way we're using the system to meet the need rather than having to rush out to buy the new latest shiny system yeah 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 okay okay and okay and how how much um how much time would you would you invest in in making sure you get the right technology though just given the the, the point that you just made to someone think, who's probably at the start of their journey as an organization i i think i think time is really really critical in it we all want to do it we want to do it now because we're going on that buying a system journey because there's a business reason why we are doing so we've obviously identified a gap we've, we've coughed it we've decided there's a model so we there's, a, there's that impetus to go must get must get must get but i would say that the the time you invest at the beginning and scoping out actually what do you genuinely need the system to be capable of doing is worth three times at the end of the day mm -hmm. really i encourage everybody really ask yourself the searching questions. What is the exam question we are trying to answer here? What what do we need that we cannot do now? Mm. And then will this platform give us that answer? And if it will, how sustainable is it? How often is that platform going to be developed? And will it meet the needs three months, six months, three years, five years down the line? Mm. Beyond five years down the line, let's not even bother looking because the technology is changing so fast that anything beyond that is way outside the event horizon we can see yeah yeah okay okay and, and where do you see it going um john obviously i know we're talking about the uh, the netflix of learning so essentially we are talking about the, the digital kind of tech side of things yeah. certainly in organizations like like yourself where there's 35,000 people as you rightly mentioned very complex very difficult to i guess do anything face to face especially in the in this era um, and, and the ways of working at the moment. But um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that kind of like whole kind of like face to face piece? Do you still see value in that? Do you think the two should exist together um, or do you think it will go in one direction completely? Um, I 100, 100% think both need to exist. There is a there is a place in corporate learning for both. I think what the COVID pandemic has shown a lot of I don't know how to phrase this, more, more long in the tooth individuals in big organisations. What it has shown them is that no longer is learning confined to the training room. Mm. We certainly saw a lot of people who thought that you hadn't been trained if you hadn't been in that room with the U-shaped table, the whiteboard and the flip chart and the PowerPoint deck. <laughs> that was training. Mm. Um, the pandemic has helped us break down that silo. Of, oh, actually, I can learn online as well. This is This is viable. This is still learning. But there are certain skills there are certain practical elements where you cannot beat being in the room with somebody and actually going through the going through that as a as a shared journey i think what i'm seeing and what i'm hoping continues is that shift away from everything must be face to face unless we can persuade them that e-learning or online learning is a viable option mm. to we've got all these ways to learn all oh, this one actually spending a day together in a room is going to be hugely beneficial for this reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Okay. And then just to kind of almost play devil's advocate, I I certainly prefer the the face-to-face -face stuff because yeah. I like to be engaged. I like to be able to read body language and, and kind of sit right in front of the person that I'm, I'm speaking to. How do you make that experience, um, I don't know, how do you almost recreate that experience? Aside from the kind of modules piece, I'm talking about if you're potentially doing a group type session and, and what are your thoughts on, on enhancing that experience, I guess? So I, so I think there is absolutely validity in what you are saying, Magnus, and sometimes we do need those cues off each other. So when we're doing training in the, the virtual, the online world, it can't be somebody reading a slide deck to you over a mm. webinar. And we are we as a, as a learning function in our organization we're really really key that we don't talk about learning webinars 
because you go on a webinar, that's somebody talking at you for an hour or two hours, whatever it is. What we want is to create events that people have interactivity with. So it's about, again, choosing the right technology for the job, whether you're on Teams, Zoom, Google Meet, there's probably thousands of others that I haven't listed. But what, what can we do with our attendees while they're on that session that keeps them engaged, that gets them involved? Mm. Um, are there bolt-on tools? And I mean, I don't want to name names here because we're not we're not here to advertise platforms not present. <laughs> but there are a couple of platforms that we use in our organisation quite heavily that work really beautifully with MS Teams, which um, happens to be our choice of online platform because everything's Microsoft Office and it comes with. Mm. So we've got that that road. But this tool creates never-ending virtual whiteboards. Okay. So that everybody can see, can share live. So they're in a Teams meeting. They've got all the faces around the edge of the wall so they can see the other delegates. But you can put your ideas on a virtual sticky note. You can answer questions. You can ask questions. And all of this is kicking off on this virtual whiteboard in the middle of the screen. Mm. So we're actually giving that. Here's some slides. Here's a video. Here's somebody talking. Here's a little group exercise. You can go off into your own little corner of the whiteboard with a breakout room and pull your yeah. bits together. So for me, it's all about what are the cool and the useful elements of face-to-face -face that we can move into the digital world. And actually, with a little bit of a look around, there, there are the tools that make that possible. Mm -hmm. And then, as I say, face-to-face, -face, when it matters, when it's going to give us a bang for the buck that you just cannot do over one of these video links. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely spot on. And, and certainly some of the group sessions that I've done for various things over the last uh, couple of months have had the, 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 the capabilities that you mentioned there in terms of breaking out into group sessions, the whiteboards and whatnot, um, which I think are, are, are super helpful um, for sure. And I guess to play devil's advocate again, obviously we're talking about uh, these tools and, 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 and these systems. Um, how do you go about then making sure that the the user uh, the, the the user has a good experience in, in in terms of how the system runs and operates and, and so on and so forth? Because that's a learning piece in itself, right? <laughs> there, there is, and, and it's all it's always that balance of you can have all this whizzy technology and all these all these extra functionalities, but you're going to add twenty minutes to the start of your session teaching everybody how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or. Again, going back to that, having the right selection criteria. So actually having that design process. And most of us have been through this, the, the, the L&D design models and the thought processes around what good design looks like. And it's actually bringing that to our virtual session saying, what do I really want people to be able to do? What tool should I use to do that that's mm. easy, that's simple? And like I say, the, the virtual whiteboard tool we've got, I, I think is really easy. I've had great feedback from the learners on it because it's there's a big plus in the bottom. You click the plus and it says, do you want to add a question? Do you want to add a note? And it kind of walks them through it as they're doing it. Mm. So it becomes, oh, yeah, I just do that. I just do that. Yeah, yeah. Easy. <laughs> yeah. Rather than we used to have what we used to have one system way, back in the day before everything went to Teams, when Teams came on the scene. And I, I kid you not, Magnus, we genuinely would start um, as an online webinar. The first 15 minutes would be where all the controls were and yeah. a walk around the screen of what you could do. And it just, yeah. it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. No, fantastic. Well, well, well said, well said. Um, and John, I mean, listen, you've done uh, you've done fantastically well, considering you came into the session expecting to be having a panel discussion. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, like I say, the tech issues uh, haven't allowed that to be the case but but honestly uh really really huge thank you um for for some of that um insights it's been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation um and i've certainly tried to throw a few a few curveballs that you've uh you've you've dealt with exceptionally well um and and, and rightly so as, as as i obviously know you know the space really well um but just before we end the session john if you yep. had a key takeaway that you'd leave with the viewers or listeners um, what would that be? I think, I think I've already said it in, as we went along, Magnus, but the key takeaway is don't be captured by the shiny, shiny of the new piece of technology. Pick the tool that's going to do what you actually need it to do. This podcast was brought to you by a wrap to Annapurna, the number one platform that case studies the organisations that not only disrupt, but those that erupt. Please visit our new GoRupt website, 
for more content and log in to watch the full episodes from the conference. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Make sure to watch out for the next.